Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to ARC's FYI podcast. My name is Yassine Almandra. I lead crypto at ARC. And today I have the pleasure of being joined by two very special guests, Ophelia Snyder, who's the president and co-founder of 21 Shares, and Eli Dinga, who's the head of research at 21 Shares. Uh, for a little bit of context, uh, ARK has recently partnered with 21 Shares on the crypto front, and we thought it would be a great opportunity for the ARK audience to learn a little bit more about 21 Shares, what they stand for, what they've been doing, and their overall thoughts on the crypto market space. Ophelia, Ellie, honored to have you on. Really excited about this conversation. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks for having us. Good to be here. Awesome. Well, let, let's dive right in. Given we do have a, a founder of 21 Shares on the call, maybe Ophelia, you can start with really what inspired the founding of 21 Shares and you know, what's the mission? How has that mission evolved since its inception? A little bit of rundown of, of what you guys stand for would be would be great. Yeah, it's, it's been a it's been a really interesting five years, which is crazy to think about. It's our five-year anniversary this month. We launched the company, me and me and Hanny, um, to solve a problem for our moms, which maybe sounds odd. I'm in a very small minority of people for whom one of the first people who ever came to talk to me about crypto was actually my mother, who was telling me about how, you know, it makes perfect sense. There should be a global monetary system because Merck spends too much money on hedging and uh, joint monetary systems is a great tool for uh, peace. Uh, I believe this should happen. And I'm like, okay, have you heard of this thing called Bitcoin? I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, and she totally got it. And by the way, this was crazy early. This was like 2013, 2014. Um, and my mom is telling me all this and she totally gets the purpose of it, but she actually missed the trade. And she missed the trade because at the time there was some little known company called Coinbase that like, I don't trust them with my money. Why would I open a new bank account just to make one investment? That makes no sense whatsoever. I don't know who they are. I don't know anything about them. The technical infrastructure is just way too technical. Like, ah, eh, screw it. I'll invest in um, VC deals in and around the space. And needless to say, those companies did not do particularly well. And she missed out on this like great trade, especially given the fact that she completely understood the point. There was just no good access point for somebody like her um, in the crypto ecosystem. And Hanny had a separate but actually very similar issue with his mom also wanting to make these kinds of allocations. And Hanny and I got to talking a couple of years later and we're, we're sharing all of this um, and realized that there was a space for an instrument here. We needed to find something that we could put our moms in. And at the time, things were either like structured products that were very expensive. They were either very large premium discounts. There wasn't really a good way to give them something or something we could say, you know, hey, mom, you can totally put your money in this. We feel great about it. You know, go for it. And so we ended up building a product for our moms. It was really simple. There wasn't really a plan to have necessarily like a whole company behind it. We just wanted to solve a very simple problem for some people who were asking us a favor. And uh, Hanny and I known each other for a very long time and we started working on it. Um, I really love financial product structuring and like how the plumbing of these things work. And Hanny came from a tech background. And so we just started looking at, you know, how can we actually fix our mom's issues? And we looked at dozens of jurisdictions to try to figure out how we could best do this. And we were very far away from a, a crypto ETF of any kind in America. Um, so we looked at other places we might be able to start. And we ended up starting in Switzerland. Uh, and then since then, we've launched almost 40 different products covering most major crypto assets, uh, 
We're now managing about $1.5 billion in assets for clients, primarily in Europe and the Middle East. Um, and we really are the largest provider in the space of these types of products. But that, that came about sort of as an incidental response to trying to solve a very simple issue uh, for our moms of bridging traditional finance and people who make traditional financial investments with crypto. How do we welcome people into this ecosystem? How do we give them tools to meet, you know, to meet them where they're at in their process? Um, and that's actually become one of the guiding lights of the company. It's how do we help people get comfortable with the space and have instruments that they can use to actually access a fundamentally quite technical part of finance. I love that core mission: please the mother. There's, a, I think, no, there's, <laughs> there's no that. That's so funny because I. I didn't have I, I didn't have a I guess similar story uh, relative to my mom, but the way that I got introduced to, to crypto was was through my dad. Random summer day, my dad had just a portfolio of equities that he was managing, and he asked me, you know, you're not doing anything. It's the summer. Why why don't you just look into any other interesting investment opportunities? Uh, and it was that that catalyzed the discovery into into the crypto rabbit hole. Um, so I have my dad to thank for that. And uh, it's, it's great to see that you guys have your moms to thank for that. Before before we dive into I, I do have a few follow up questions um, with you, Ophelia. But I want Ellie, what what has your what's your story of the how did you fall down the crypto rabbit hole? Uh, when did you join 21 shares? Um, how has that role evolved since first starting? Yeah, sure, sure. It's a, it's a great question. So similar timeline with Ophelia as well. 2013. Um, I was finishing up my master's in France in international finance, but I had a class completely unrelated to uh, my background uh, in cryptography and computer science. And I was so confused because the professor was not even that, like your typical professor from academia. He was a former Navy SEAL uh, who served in Afghanistan back in 2011, and he discovered Bitcoin through the soldiers. Uh, and the soldiers at that time were saying that Bitcoin could disrupt gold and local currencies in places like Lebanon and Venezuela, and that he has to actually learn about it and figure out how to use it. At that time, the only exchange that was existing was Mongox and then over peer-to-peer -peer, uh, Bitcoin marketplaces where you could exchange cash for, for Bitcoin uh, and disclosing, of course, your wallet address without your private key. Um, but... Uh, I was amazed because like, he was explaining elliptic curve and digital signatures and explaining the whole thing without actually talking about the currency, which he discovered back in 2011. So at that time, it was 2014, and I tried to actually get really deep into the rabbit hole because my family background is from Sub-Saharan Africa in Congo, and it takes so much time with a lot of money as well to send money overseas. Um, and it's so horrendous that... To be honest, it's very similar to how you would send a text message from the U.S. to France back in the early 2000s. Um, it would take you a lot, a lot of time, but also like a lot of money as well to figure it out. So I tried to basically understand how we could use the technology um, with other things than, than Bitcoin. So basically stable coins. How could you use fiat currencies on the blockchain to send money overseas and finance uh, developers and entrepreneurs in places like Southeast Asia and so forth. Uh, and that went on to become my early start in the rabbit hole of Bitcoin and the rest of the assets. And that was way before Ethereum, when basically Tether came out, you know, two years after the launch of Ethereum and then circled 2018. But the, my whole thesis was around how can we use the coins to create an entire startup ecosystem in Southeast Asia and South Southern Africa. Um, and then actually at 21 shares, nearly four years ago, um, so when the company was having probably like 15 to 18 employees at that time. But one of the things that really stood out with Henny and Ophelia when I met them at the time was how they were focusing so deeply about education, because the journey in the crypto asset industry really started with education, and there is a lot out there. When we all discovered Bitcoin, Ophelia and I probably crypto Twitter was not even a thing, right? So you had to go through Bitcoin forums and Bitcoin.org to figure out what is, what is the latest. Um, you had to look at the white paper, but the white paper was not even talking about the security supply or any of the things that are super important about how actually Bitcoin works uh, from an economics perspective. So education is key and, and that's everything that we do in the research team. Uh, so from a couple of people in the research team four years ago to now six researchers, 
what we do is really digging deep into the asset class uh, from content, from real-time dashboards, uh, from webinars, and that's why we're super excited to talk about the asset class all the time. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. I think that that's part of why there's just high alignment between 21 shares and ARC. You know, Kathy's founding story is often because of the, you know, closed walls and siloed uh, information uh, that you see in traditional asset management. Here you are introducing an asset class that completely tears that concept to shreds and it provides everything openly and freely and transparently. I think in the same way, you know, you look at it investing across uh, other asset classes, being able to sort of provide a transparent education feeds into the investment process and feeds into the brand building in a way that I think traditional asset managers don't really appreciate. It, it, it sounds like you two both have some common threads on your initial interaction with crypto. Infrastructure was pretty limited, right? You, Ellie Mount Gox, um, you affiliate with, with Coinbase. And, and that, that has evolved, but I, I'd, be, I'd be curious on, can you just dive a little bit deeper into what exactly it is that you offer? Uh, and I think it's a little bit separate than what a Coinbase might offer. Uh, but I'd, I'd be curious on, you know, where your product positioning is. Uh, you mentioned you have ETPs, where most of those are uh, and, and how that, I'd say either how that has made the infrastructure more mature or how that had kind of solved glaring gaps in the existing infrastructure pre-21 shares era. So it's a very different product offering from that perspective. And, and most of our products are available um, on stock exchanges in Europe and in the Middle East. And so the way that these products actually work is they let you buy exposure to spot crypto um, through a standard stock exchange. And there's a bunch of benefits to doing it that way. Primarily, you're not opening a new account. You're using your existing bank or brokerage, right? If you can buy a share of Nestle or UBS or insert company here, you, you can access these products. And that makes it much easier for a bunch of people. So it makes it much easier for people like my mom who don't want new infrastructure. You can work with your existing asset manager or advisor, you can work within an existing platform that you already have your money on. It's much simpler from that perspective, which also then sort of leads to tax and like infrastructure. And there's a lot of boring things that we all have to do as people, but also fund managers have to do at like a fairly industrial scale in terms of how they report, how they report taxes, how they record taxes, how they record gains and losses. This actually fits within those existing work streams. So you're suddenly you don't have crypto as this other thing that you're doing that requires all of this crypto native infrastructure. We essentially provide all of that for you and repackage it in a way where it exists inside of your existing setup. Um, it makes it easier on a bunch of in a bunch of different ways. It also makes it possible for an entirely new group of people. So, for example, most asset managers do not have the ability to open a crypto account for a bunch of reasons. A lot of which have to do with things like compliance. Um, or like their risk appetite or the way their own internal infrastructure works. They might want to make the allocation, but the infrastructure investment to do that is not like the juice isn't worth the squeeze to some extent on like how much they're actually going to get from setting all of that up. And these products drastically simplify that, right? This now operates like any other product in a portfolio. It operates like every other asset class you're allocating to. That's really powerful in terms of welcoming new people to the space. Now all you have to do is say, I understand a thesis, I have a thesis in the space, I want to participate. Not, I think this is interesting, I have a thesis, I'm going to make an investment. Now let me go spend the next three to six months figuring out how to set up a way in which to do that. Um, and that's really the major gap that we're bridging here, which is actually making it just a lot easier for people to participate. And can I just clarify, this participation you're referring to is, it, it, it remains limited to just gaining exposure to the asset class. Uh, or are there ways to actually bridge, and I, and I, and I, I see, I, I, I believe that that's the case, bridge it with the actual crypto ecosystem. Uh, and so far as, you know, you're gaining exposure to, let's say, an ETP that holds underlying Bitcoin. But, you know, I, I'm sure all of us would agree that there are also advantages to holding the underlying Bitcoin. Are, are we there yet? What does that world look like? Um, and is, is that something that you know, you guys, I'm sure, th are thinking about a lot where it's like, how do you sort of balance the, the those trade-offs? Most of our products have physical redemption options. So if you want to exit and kind, you can. Um, 
coincidentally, that actually creates a ton of tax advantages, especially in Europe. But mm -hmm. okay. you, you can't do that. There are different pieces of crypto allocations, right? There's crypto that you intend to use for crypto native functions, and there's crypto that you're investing in. And they're actually a little bit different. There's a difference between something that you're trying to do an action with. So for example, I want to go play a on-chain game of some kind, Axie or something like that, and I need on-chain assets in order to actually facilitate that. That's great. You should have those, right? That's the money that is essentially, you can think of it similar to what you have in your checking account when you go buy a video game, right? Like that's actual asset that you're using to procure a service in real time versus assets that you're investing in and saving in long-term. And there's obviously a link between those two things, right? You want to be able to take things from your long-term savings and eventually use them for something, but you may not want all of those things at the same time. And the way you think about storage and yield and things like that, especially in crypto around those two areas of your portfolio are very, very, very different. Um, and so, for example, one of the key benefits to using products like ours is we have institutional grade custody. Now, the reason that matters is that unless you're storing millions of dollars of crypto, no crypto custodian is giving you access to that kind of service. And that service is segregated wallets, so you're not mixing your money with other people's. You're not holding it on exchange. It's external to any sort of bankruptcy of the custodian, so it doesn't form part of their asset base. Um, it's transparent because you can actually look it up on chain. There's a bunch of reasons to do that. It's also a lot more secure, right? It's cold storage. It involves different kinds of authentication to move assets, which is way more than they're going to give an average institutional user, let alone retail. And so what you're getting is you have this like significantly more secure structure with the ability to stake and all of these sort of additional features to it that come from this. Now, that's really, really, really helpful if what you're doing is longer term holding. And so what you're trading off here is, yes, you're right, like you're not going to use that to play Axie, but you are going to be able to have all of these other features to it. And if at some point what you want to do is liquidate that position, there's a variety of ways in which you can do that to actually make those underlying assets more usable. But there's a fairly large portion of the portfolio that, of, quite frankly, people engaged in crypto that is not intended to be used as like a spendable short term asset. Right. And it's not just that. There's also you mentioned risk appetite and going back to your mother, your grandmother. It's like how 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 comfortable are you telling them to custody their own assets on their own hardware wallet, you know, versus, let's say, relying on a call it regulated uh, product that trades on an exchange. So it's providing that optionality, I think, is 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 helpful. But for the call it average user that perhaps just wants to gain exposure, it makes a lot more sense to at least introduce it into a, a product like this than, you know, straight cold storage, for instance. Completely. And there's a really practical, actually a really funny story that Ellie and I were both a part of a couple of weeks ago of mm -hmm. somebody going through this. We had, a, we had a new joiner come into our company at like quite a senior level, actually. And we were sitting down and he was doing his first on-chain transfer. Because he's, you know, he doesn't come from a crypto background and he's he's joined on like the corporate side of our business and is learning how to actually use these products. And we have lots of people who join our company who are just learning how to use these products, right? It makes sense. Whether, whether they're in marketing, whether they're in, obviously. And it was fascinating because I was there, Ellie was there, and our CEO was there all coaching him on how to do a transfer because it felt like he was doing something wrong. And then some magical NFT that he didn't purchase popped up in his wallet. He's like, well, what is this? And we're like, yeah, that's spam. Like, what do you mean that's spam? Like I now own spam. And it's like, yeah, actually you do. And that's going to keep happening. Don't worry about it. Just ignore it. Please don't click on it. If you click on it, it could be not great. <laughs> um, and this is someone who's being actively coached by the two co-founders and the head of research on how to do this, all of whom have, I mean, yeah. I, I've been running this company for five years, but I've been in crypto significantly longer than that. You know, you're talking about decades of crypto experience sitting around watching one transfer go through because it's his first time and he's trying to figure out how to do it. And it's that's actually what this infrastructure is still like from a practical perspective. And for the record, and I mean, Ellie, correct me if I'm wrong, he did not seem thrilled. He wasn't sitting here feeling like super confident. We all we're all like, no, 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 it's supposed to look like that. It's OK. You're doing it right. <laughs> that's right, for sure. And especially when, you know, when we think about like, the complexity of crypto, um, the first level is you do peer-to-peer -peer transfers or you buy your first assets. And the second level is you try to think about using applications like XC Infinity or any other applications that are built on top of any global computing platform like Ethereum, 
Uh, and then the third level is trying to actually generate yield, et cetera. Of course, none of that is financial advice for the audience. But what we're seeing is that people can rapidly now go to level three and skipping level two and level one as well um, because they get incentivized to see what is out there. It was super limited in the beginning, right? Like 2013, 2014. But today there is a plethora of like applications that you can poke around with. Uh, but there are so many best practices that people have to keep in mind before going from level one to level three. Um, and that's why education is key. So wh where do you think the biggest education gap is today, Ellie? I think there is a big delta between news and insights. So news is what you have on your Twitter feed, what you have on media outlets. Um, and insights is how do you differentiate what is true and what is not. Um, and I think that's the biggest gap when it comes to how do you try to understand the asset class from first principles. So basically the law of physics. Uh, are they all currencies? How do you value crypto assets? What is the benefit of crypto assets in your portfolio? Um, does that make any, any sense to see any addresses tagged uh, on chain that are potentially associated with a specific entity? Are they true? Uh, do we have the transparency behind the methodology? Um, do we have the best practices to secure assets if people choose to have non-custodial solutions? Uh, do they think about insurance as well? And, and I think like from a security perspective, there is a lot of know-how to be in place. Um, but when it comes to how people consume information, um, I think getting insights at the tip of their fingertips is, is super important. Um, and that's exactly what we try to do um, as much as possible with our content, as well as our dashboards uh, that are actually some of the top dashboards in the industry that people refer to. Uh, but uh, I would say insights is one of the most critical thing that people really need to have at their fingertips um, as they try to navigate into this asset class. When you think about it, the asset class is as, as big as the stats in the industry in 2001, right? Uh, we're just at the early innings of that. Half a billion people have access to crypto. Um, so it means that it's like 1% of people's problems in the world. Uh, but uh, at least for the 1% serve, uh, it's very important to have the best in class information and on the side for sure. Can, can you talk a little bit more about uh, how your research team is set up? Uh, maybe dive into some of the dashboards that, you, that you've that you referenced, what that research process looks like, what's most top of mind today? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, the, the way we're looking at the asset class uh, is, is very similar to how we are uh, trying to divvy up the uh, entire internet industry. So we have so many sectors in crypto, as you know, we have DeFi, we have gaming, we have Bitcoin, and Ethereum, uh, and a plethora of assets. And to some extent, they are highly connected with one another. So the way we structure the team is to divvy up the entire territory and trying to make sure that we have a holistic understanding of the asset class. Um, and that's how we basically have specific researchers focusing on DeFi, others focusing on basically platforms like Ethereum, and, and Bitcoin as well. And then, of course, the long tail assets, because it's impossible for one person to understand the asset class uh, completely. Um, and that's why, you know, having differentiated but diverse opinions is super important to uh, have a better understanding about what's coming up next and what is actually happening right now in the asset class. However, the good thing with crypto, unlike any of the asset classes, is that you have real time data. But the real-time data needs to be dissected. So you got to have essentially, you know, the surgeons that we call wizards in our team trying to dissect what is true and what is not when we're looking at these raw on-chain data. Um, so in order to form a thesis, in order to form your insights, you will need to have a better understanding about uh, on-chain analytics. That's something that is impossible unlike any other asset classes, because you have to wait at the end of each quarter to have access to fundamental metrics and understanding about a specific entity or a specific company. While in crypto for Bitcoin and Ethereum in the long tail, you have that in real time, but it needs to make a lot of sense for the end consumer. Uh, and that's why we actually have these real-time dashboards, essentially real-time financial statements for Bitcoin and Ethereum so that uh, you know, investors in the entire community can see in real time 
um, what is going on when it comes to the number of active addresses, the activity that is happening on chain on Ethereum, the number of dApps built on top, the retention rate of each application is built on top of Ethereum, for example, um, and as well as how we can actually use on-chain data for also measuring uh, contagion risks. You know, for example, like last year when we had major collapses, we had actually real-time dashboards tracking multiple addresses that were able uh, to, to help the investors get a better understanding about these on-chain movements. So we basically divvy up our, our on-chain strategy with fundamental metrics. When you think about the financial statements for Bitcoin and Ethereum, we have that, as well as how do we think about some of these momentum events or contagion risk that needs to be contained and that we can have more transparency thanks to blockchain uh, transparency and, and, and data. Uh, and that's how we basically form our whole strategy here. And, and, and that's how we, we think about the whole architecture of the research team. At the end of the day, it's having a holistic understanding of the asset class to, to give uh, the best in class insights. That's incredible. I, I think one of the most underappreciated parts of this asset class is just how radically transparent the data is. But to your point, how much of it needs to be parsed, manipulated to fully understand and flesh out. Uh, and the, I, I think r really interesting work that you that you guys are doing on, you know, the contagion risk uh, aspect of it as well, because you have, OK, you know, we're Bitcoin and Ethereum working as design, we're seeing transaction volumes, active addresses peaking, correlating with price or whatever the case is. But then there's a whole sort of other, you know, rabbit hole to fall down of what is the relative health of this ecosystem and what do potential black swan events look like um, if they were to occur at, at specific times or under specific circumstances. Uh, and, and more than that, to then be able to share that data and tell everyone, look, Come look at this data that we're parsing. Come look at this data that we've analyzed. It's such a different um, tone than you know what we've seen in, in, in other asset classes and other approaches to let's say you know gaining gaining edge. It's like the edge is 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 out there. So it's like the the edge is if you're the one that's kind of leading the effort to sharing that information rather than finding it and sort of safeguarding it for yourself. So. It's a really interesting um, research philosophy. Well, it's actually, I mean, it's not surprising that it's not very dissimilar from Marx. That's right. That's uh, right. I mean, <laughs> we, yeah. I, I think by, by, in a lot of ways by, by design, I think, you know, again, there's just the, the broader arc umbrella of let's put our research out, whether it's, you know, a Tesla evaluation model that we're going to open source. Uh, but that's also why we're so interested in crypto. It's par part of the, the reason why, you know, we've we've doubled down and have such high conviction is because of how um, aligned a lot of the ethos is with 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 Ark's mission. Um, so, you know, we we've we spent a lot of time looking at on chain as well. Uh, I think, you know, you s summed it up quite nicely, Ellie, as to sort of the the path one takes inside of the on chain world. Uh, that it's, you know, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of noise. How do you find that signal on one end? But then two, you know, being being humble enough to acknowledge that you're not going to understand everything that's going on in the asset class. So then strategically sort of finding the people um, to specialize in certain parts of the market um, is also really important. But it takes a skill, I think, to be able to identify, you know, what those parts actually are. Um, and so, you know, it's a really kind of, a, it's a exciting um, new framework uh, of research that we don't, that we've never really gotten, um, that doesn't really fit cleanly into any previous bucket. Uh, and I'm sure we'll, we'll evolve. Uh, Ellie, you're probably the first to know. Five years ago, the on-chain world looked a lot different than it looks now. Man, I, I want to ask you, in five years, how does research evolve? What, is, what does it look like? It's a great question. Um, and Ophelia and I and the rest of the team at 21 Shares have spent a lot of time to think about how can we build timeless standards for, for the industry. Um, and we first thought about classifying the asset class. Um, so that's why we launched uh, the Global Classification Standard earlier this year in partnership with Fungeco so that we can have a holistic understanding about the asset class itself and how the industries and sectors 
within crypto actually are evolving over time because today we are 90% focused on financial services with DeFi, but they may evolve with other sectors and industries that we haven't seen yet. Think about cybersecurity, think about military services that could, could be built on top of crypto. Uh, that's, how, that's why we launched the classification standard so that we can see that in real time for us and look at how all these different protocols and applications built on top uh, or servicing the world with uh, various products and services. Uh, and we have to be nimble, we have to adapt to that. And it's hard, and that's why it's a fast-paced industry and we have to build standards so that it's helping us to keep track of the asset class and at the same time think more broadly about product innovation, where we, of course, can talk about product innovation here, but it really comes with, okay, how does this asset class look like? Can we architect the asset class like S&P and MSCI did in the late 1990s with GICS to classify the entire stock market. And now that we have the same standard for crypto, how do we make sure that we understand this asset class fully? Because today we are having 17% of the entire crypto value focused on Bitcoin and Ethereum, which are essentially infrastructure players. But we are going to see more and more applications going forward. How does that look like? What about the token models? What about the business models? What about the monetary policies? Are they going to change? Uh, and these are the things that we ask ourselves um, a lot so that we can better understand the asset class and trying to adapt to it going forward. And then the other thing is, uh, on the back of the valuation um, you know, frameworks and allocation models that we built, we basically built all these models on the back of our classification standards because, of course, you're not going to evaluate a financial company the same way you would think about the TAM of a military company, right? So on the back of that, we really try as much as possible to really build these standards to help the investors get from zero to one into the asset class. And then how does that translate into product innovation? And I think I would add to that, it's one of the reasons why we, we touched on this earlier, like why people need help here. And I think it's true. It's true on research. It's true on education. It's true on product. There's a lot of really wonderful corollaries between TradFi and crypto. 100%. And I think it can sometimes be hard to see and hard to understand if somebody doesn't actually take the time to create a common language of some kind. And to some extent, that's been missing. It's, it's one of the reasons why you still need specialists in this space the development of that common language is still in its in, in, in its infancy, right? And, and a lot of that comes from research and a lot of that comes from free and transparent research. Um, on the flip side, there's a certain level of expertise that you need to generate that content, to generate products that are going to perform the way they're supposed to and, and do what they say on the label and um, actually work. And that we're still at that stage of education and infrastructure in the sector. And I think we sometimes forget that. Um, because it's come such a long way in the last five years, such an unbelievably long way in the last five years. But there's still this sort of lack of connection for a lot of people and understanding that it's not that everything you know about industries and classifications and financials and corporate actions and infrastructure and tradability, that hasn't all gone flying out the window. There are corollaries here. There are, there are nuances and things that are different, absolutely. But there's a, a large part that's actually internally consistent. And so helping people recognize that and helping them build that knowledge base so they're confident in sort of their own analysis is a key piece here. I think that's a really good point. I think there are a lot of corollaries. I think the way that it evolves, though, relative to TradFi is a lot of the call it build out of those classifications was top down in a way that I think in crypto will be bottom up, just given the nature of how information is, is discovered and how it's iterated upon that's both like a blessing and a curse where it becomes a lot harder than standardize those classifications and then create frameworks that everyone can agree upon. But it is free market-esque where over the long term, I think the sort of the best or most salient or most coherent um, standardization uh, will prevail. Which brings me, maybe, to, maybe we can s switch gears a little bit. I've had the pleasure of getting to know both Ellie and Ophelia um, behind the scenes. And Ophelia, this one's for you. I've never met someone who's as, let's say, not just galaxy brain on regulation or operations, 
but also very, very passionate about it. Kathy and I always discuss it like how why how is she so passionate about regulation? <laughs> and so maybe Ophelia, you can maybe share your relationship with that. But then more than that, I'd love to get your take on how you're viewing the regulatory landscape for crypto. Um, you mentioned earlier in this conversation that you know a lot of your products and a lot of your business is based in Europe, um, providing perhaps an overview of you know the different jurisdictions and, and perhaps is there a way for them all to converge towards a standardized framework? I'll, I'll stop there and take, take it away, Ophelia. Um, yeah, so I, I, I do have that reputation for being a bit of a, a wonk when it comes to, uh, to policy and regulations and, and structuring, because actually they're the same thing. Um, and that's why I actually like it so much, is that you can't build really excellent, excellent product if you don't understand regulations, and you'll never understand regulations if you don't understand history. Rules are not made because we think it's funny. Rules are not. No one, no one sits around and says, you know what I want to do today? I want to write the 33 Act on how securities are going to be regulated in the United States. Why? Because I think it would make great wallpaper. Like, that's not how that works, right? It's being done based on logic. And logic can change. Logic can absolutely change. And logic evolves over time. And so regulatory logic is typically lagging in some ways, right? We're using a document written in 1933 to regulate things in 2023. It's almost 100 years old. It's not going to be a perfect fit, definitionally, unless we've done nothing for the last 100 years, which is a completely different and equally depressing thought process. Um, and so I think one of the things that people neglect with regulation, one of the reasons people don't get into it is they don't realize that it's actually an artifact of history. And crypto loves to reinvent the wheel. We love to say we've come up with something new and we've done it in this slightly different way than TradFi. We, we love doing that. But oftentimes we neglect to actually remember why it was done this way in the first place. Hey, did you know that in 1973 XYZ happened and that's why this product is structured this way? And there's a regulation that was actually made because on the back of that, these other six things happened. Um, it doesn't mean it's always right. It doesn't mean it's always going to work for every situation, but it is representative of an accumulation of human knowledge that shouldn't be so callously disregarded, right? Part of the beauty of what we're doing now is we get to stand on the shoulders of giants, right? We get to build these unbelievably cool systems, but it's based on standing on the shoulders of Satoshi, but also, by the way, just as much standing on the shoulders of JP Morgan, the human being, who actually did a ton of work on how markets function. Um, and, and that's something that sometimes gets lost. And so th that's where my love of regulation actually comes from, is that I, for me, it's actually a culmination of human progress and a snapshot of history. And it shouldn't be static. And it's actually not as static as people think, because actually the interpretation of law ends up being a large, and the interpretation of regulation ends up being a large component of, um, of regulation. It's actually one of the things I'm most excited about for uh, Mika. So segueing a little bit to standardization, um, you know, we obviously, we have products in Europe, uh, footprint in Switzerland and in most European countries at this point. Um, and we, we deal with regulations in dozens of jurisdictions. I do believe that we are going to end up with more of a harmonized system than people currently expect. And I believe it will be a more harmonized system than what existing financial infrastructure looks like. Mika is a wonderful example of that. So the European Union spent a very, very, very long time trying to do any sort of harmonization of their financial markets infrastructure. That was actually really, really difficult. And They've come out with, they came out with a bunch of regulations, some of which were great, some of which were terrible. And Mika is one of those things where it's actually quite promising. It, it's got the standardization components. Everyone, not everyone is thrilled about everything that's in there, but it's always going to be some kind of a compromise. Um, and at least it gives us a, a rule book. I think the jury is still out on what those regulations are actually going to look like because I think there's a misconception sometimes when it comes to regs, which is that, hey, we wrote the regulation, we're done. And it's like, actually, no. For example, uh, there was a, a regulation in, in Europe um, called, called PRIPS around how different types of financial products are regulated within the European Union and what information requirements were going to come out of that as part of the prospectus directives and, and a few other things. And, and it, at the end result is issuers of financial products need to produce documentation in a certain way. And it's and a bunch of other things are also in there. But the, the one anecdote I'm going to tell you guys is about like the least interesting thing of all time, which is documentation. Um and there are all these annexes that actually tell you how you're supposed to do it. None of the annexes for Mika are done yet. The actual implementation is a complete unknown still. And so there's this tendency of saying, like, the devil's in the details with this stuff. How are we actually going to implement it? What's it going to look like? But I do have a lot of reason to be optimistic. And I think the U.S. 
any movement from the U.S. Uh, will hopefully help with that harmonization. Um, because there, are, there is quite a bit of harmonization between global securities regulations and U.S. securities regulations. So as the U.S. moves, I think it will help promote that. I think um, what's happening in Europe also helps tremendously um, in terms of having that sort of more unified system. Well, what, what clarity or, or guidance do you think is lacking today? Uh, is that easily uh, resolvable? Or is it going to take you know, concerted effort? So there are two approaches. Um, you can take the approach that the European Union took, which is that we're actually going to regulate crypto as its own thing, right? It, it, it's got its own regulations, its own implementation. And that's sort of one path you can take. The other path you can take is saying, we're just going to apply this existing rule book, and this is the rule book we are going to apply. Both versions take quite a bit of time. One version, like if you're going to define crypto as its own asset class, now you have to do a bunch of definitions around the asset class and how it's going to work. Um, goes to some of what Ellie was talking about, GCCS. Um, but you're going to need to do that and a lot more. And you're going to need to create a flexible and dynamic framework. Switzerland did a great job with that, but they did it like six, seven years ago. Now. On like, this is crypto, crypto exists. Here's some rough classifications. Here are criteria to enable that classification. Go forward. It, depending on which one you're in, you fall under either commodities rules, securities rules, or currency rules, at that point, you just apply the standard playbook of how we regulate these things in this country. That's a perfectly fine approach, right? So if you take an approach like that, where you're doing the classification, and then you're applying corresponding things, that's going to be a lot faster than writing completely net new regulations. But there are pros and cons to it, because the cons being a lot of crypto doesn't linearly fit, and there's a bunch of things you're not going to be able to do. And then you kind of, in either flavor of this that you take, you're not getting away from those implementation notes. So I think it's going to be a long process, but I think the first decision of we're segmenting crypto, these are the rule books that are going to be applied, is going to solve like 90% of people's problems, um, especially for operators in the space. It's really difficult. And it's one of the things that we did as a company. We started in Switzerland, partially because Switzerland had a very clear list of rules. Like, this is what it is. This is what you need to do. Go and do it that de-risks a lot of actually doing business in the sector. It makes things much easier. And so I think even if we just get that piece in place, even if the full implementation isn't done, you're going to see most of the logjam come undone. People will feel a lot more comfortable. You'll see a lot more innovation. You'll see faster pace of innovation. You'll see it be more mainstream in that way. So I apologize, it's not a straight answer because the answer is actually both, right? It's going to take forever to actually finish this process because of the number of rules, the number of different assets, the number of different circumstances that it impacts. But the majority of the benefit comes quite quickly. So like, think of it as what is the 80-20 rule? It's very much an 80-20 rule kind of thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Re reinforces sort of the, the initial premise that it's really just a lagging snapshot of history and that's not static. So it, by definition, it, it will be evolving forever. Yeah. When, when and it's think, beautiful. It, it, it's sure. a beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm, I'm in complete agreement. I think we need to sort of take this Switzerland approach, at least at, at the onset, to solve a, a lot of the, you know, going back to education gap. The, part of, I think, the reason why, you know, investors, at least institutionally, are hesitant to dip their toes is because there is still you know, regulatory uncertainty and not a clear framework by which they can refer to, you know, if they you know, do end up, let's say, making a mistake or regretting or needing, feeling the need to double down. Um, so yeah, I definitely agree with that. As we, as we wrap up here, um, are, are there maybe, are there any sort of innovative either research topics that you guys are looking at products or services that you're excited about uh, launching that are, are in the pipeline. Um, what does, say, the next year or two, and so far as you can share, what does that look like for, for 21 shares? I guess both on the research front and broader pleasing the mother mission. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, well, I think on the, on the, on the broader side, uh, not, not to bury the lead, but uh, we're obviously launching an entire new suite of products um, in America, in partnership with ARC, which we're super excited about. It's both, you know, when it comes to that, the the bridging mission and, and welcoming people to the space, it, lets us, it allows us to expand that to a whole new market. And it's uh, a product of 
quite frankly, a lot of the things that we've been talking about on this call around research and data and fundamentals in the sector. Um, and also, quite frankly, I think it's a, a reflection of very solid alignment between 21 Chairs and ARC that's gone on for a, a long time. Um, and I'm excited to actually have work out in the world on that basis. I think in our legacy markets, what you can expect to see from us is a broader range of products. We're going to continue to to innovate and expand the suite. Um, it's our, always been our view that we both want to provide people with packaged products that are things like indexes where, you know, you can rely on our expertise to figure out your allocations. We also like providing products that are, you know, design your own destiny and actually giving clients all of the tools they need to make anything under the sun they can think of um, in crypto uh, that sort of meets certain institutional uh, qualifications. And I think we're, we're going to continue to double down on that as well as, you know, expanding that footprint. Um, and I think on research, I can hand it over to Ellie. No, on the research side, uh, for us, we're incredibly excited about the Cambrian explosion that we see today on, on multiple assets, including Bitcoin. Many people think that Bitcoin is a boring payment network um, or an emerging store of value like gold. But now we're seeing a Cambrian explosion of like smart contracts built on Bitcoin. Uh, we're seeing Bitcoin becoming more of a, of a tech play. Um, and, and it means that nothing is static in crypto and we have to understand the asset class a lot better uh, from how they evolve from a technological standpoint. We're seeing early experiments, but everything that you see on FAM is starting to become more available on Bitcoin right now. Think about token standard, like ERC-20. We have ERC-20 now on Bitcoin. We're seeing the conversions between traditional finance systems and, and, and DeFi. Um, I think the Monetary Authority of Singapore is the best example of that, when actually they try to poke around with the Polygon blockchain and, and, and trying to tokenize Government bonds and, um, and and fiat assets. So I think what is super exciting here is that we're seeing that the asset class is beyond uh, speculation uh, and that it's becoming more and more used. Uh, as we've seen actually in the late 1990s, when many companies like the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times using TCP/IP and SFTP for sending emails. Now we're seeing the use of uh, blockchain protocols more and more coming to the back end of various companies and institutions. And I think that's super exciting, you know, um, and this is just the beginning. Um, and uh, the pace of innovation has not stopped, despite the fact that we've been in a bear market. Um, and, and I think that would definitely translate in consumer centric uh, product innovation down the line for, for the legacy markets for sure. Awesome. Maybe we'll wrap up with one last question. Uh, you guys have been through multiple market cycles seems like you know post 2022 contagion at least the dust is or has settled what does the next cycle look like um relative to previous ones i mean i i think the market cycle is very different this time um <laughs> it's very different because the participants are different i think you're gonna see less yoloing into stuff and a much more methodical approach from people. I think the market has matured a lot. The participants have matured a lot. And I think there was a tendency in prior market cycles to say, well, crypto is different because, and so the standards don't apply to us because. And I think if you look at the players that survived this cycle and thrived through this cycle, they're not the ones who made those arguments, right? A lot of this idea that like, we don't need as much transparency and the products we have can be more expensive and less good. And no, that doesn't really matter. Nobody in crypto really cares about how that works. Like I think a lot of that narrative has died. An extremely painful death, primarily at the hands of a lot of companies failing, but I don't think that's coming back. And so as a result of that, I think you're gonna see a shift in the market towards more established players, towards more, um, to a more risk-based approach of like actually bringing a product good, solid stuff that should be in people's hands and a lot more appreciation for that, right? And it, that's not a comment on, on centralized versus decentralized because I think you could say that that applied just as much to decentralized protocols as it did to centralized players, right? So Uniswap has thrived through this market. A lot of their competitors that didn't take that same sort of approach have not. And I think that you're gonna see a lot of that. 
Um, and I think that's going to sort of separate the wheat from the chaff in the next market cycle. So that, that's, that's my view. And I think it's going to drive a bunch of changes to how the market actually conducts itself. Could it be more with Ophelia here? Um, I think we're going to see more interest models as well as the crypto infrastructure becomes more robust and resilient and efficient as well. When you think about the transactional capacity of Ethereum, it's just like 50 transactions per second um, compared to like 2,000 transactions per second for the Visa network. But there is new innovations for scaling solutions. And it means that when you move away from like 2G to 3G to 4G, so from like dial up to bandwidth, you can have new business models that wouldn't be possible in the dial-up era of the 1990s. And that's how we're going to see now more and more business models um, that couldn't be possible before. Think about like, you know, uh, prop funds and, you know, uh, market makers using things like Uniswap, as I mentioned, but like, you know, two times, three times, four times more efficient, more and more transactional. And I think, I think these things are going to create new innovations that were not possible before. Um, and that's super exciting, just like in financial services, which is like the first product market fit in, in DeFi, right? But you're going to see more of that as well with like media, entertainment, and other sectors that are going to pop out uh, in, in crypto as well. And I think, I think that's exciting. That would attract different type of entrepreneurs, different type of developers. Um, but it's going to be definitely a space that we have mentioned. Uh, just from like a security perspective, how they can set guard assets, how they can think about uh, you know, new services and products in convergence with uh, traditional finance. Um, Love it. The future is uh, bright. I really appreciate both of you hopping on a call. We're going to link all of the, your, your information in the show notes on you know where they can learn more about 21 shares and about each of you individually. I'm sure we're going to have many more conversations in the future uh, about our partnership together. And uh, thanks again for, for coming on. Thanks for having us. Thanks, you, Steve. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.